Um, so firstly, um, good morning everyone and a very, very happy Onam. Um, welcome to uh, Imprints Arts uh, Past Forward. On behalf of the Global Arts Program at Free Arts Communications Team, I'm really, really excited to welcome you all and thank you for choosing to spend your Tuesday afternoon with us here. Um, when our Vice Chancellor Professor Nirmala Rao told me about um, Anthony Bond's visit, um, we were really, really excited uh, about the possibility of uh, you know listening to him and have him share with us um, life, rigor, and practice in the context of a conservative work. But what we were also keen was to really exchange notes about the Global Arts Program at Kriya and to sort of really explore possibilities of you know how we could collaborate, so you know synergies, and really I think I'm almost. Um, certain that what is going to come out of this conversation is that uh, the only way forward in the world that we live in is collaboration. Uh, so very warm welcome to all of you and uh, without uh, much ado, thank you Anthony for being with us. We are very, very privileged to have with us Bharatanatyam exponent Alan Valli, also a very dear friend of mine. Thank you for accepting our invitation thank and being you. here. Very warm welcome uh, Professor Sumitra and Professor Swarnamani Dinesh. Um, I know that in a panel like this, uh, we have so much to talk about, so much to share. So it's possible that we could uh, uh, perhaps meander away. So I'm going to uh, try and address four important aspects, one of which is training in the context of uh, oral tradition, conservatoire, and institution-based training, and uh, arts in the context of the liberal arts. We're also going to look at arts through the lens of the future. Uh, we're going to try and uh, get some insights on technology and artificial intelligence in the world that we live in and its impact in the world of the arts and also how can we really really work together and uh, find ways in which um, all these different artists can put their um, ideas and heads together to really really uh, change uh, uh, you know the very very ever-changing future that we all live in. So Bali I'm going to start with you. But since I am the one near alone I can make it a sense why don't you start with no, in fact, I, that is really the reason I want to start with you. <laughs> sure, Bali. So I'm going to ask you really about, you know, should we have a mic just so her voice is yeah. quite soft. Oh, unless you want to project. Okay. Just not. Speak. I can talk. Yeah. Why did I agree? Yeah. Why would it So in that case, we'll skip that. Okay. Um, so, um, Bali, you have uh, learned dance uh, from the legendary Natwana's Pandalaru Chokalinga Pile, Pandalaru Subaraya Pile, more than five decades ago in the oral tradition. What really we want to ask you is to, you know, it's, it's difficult for you to distill everything, but looking back, what would you say are some of the most significant aspects that you imbibed through that tradition? And what are really uh, some of the qualities that you learned from them that you continue to give to your students? To begin with, I think that the days when I was training, those early days, actually belonged to another yuga, <laughs> another era, because it was pre intro technology, pre uh, devices, certainly no social media. <laughs> And uh, if, if I can just give you a brief introduction to the way I learned, which was that class used to begin at about 5.30 in the morning and go on until 8.30 and then there'd be a mad rush to get to school in time. But master never, it was a leisurely, immersive process. The master never, I call him master, my guru. Um, he never looked at his watch. So sometimes he'd carry on talking about the composition and I'd have to, my mother would have to plead that it was time to leave. One of the things that I think was very, very important then was for me that enriched me enormously was the fact that much of this teaching was not, they didn't have linear analysis of anything. It was not like, taking a movement and then saying, you know, this is the way I talk of ice cream scoop when I'm teaching. <laughs> they didn't have to do that. Much of it was almost a process of osmosis. osmosis. And I think it was because they were such rich repositories of the art of ancient lineages that they were so steeped in that art that just being with them, they managed, you managed to imbibe a great deal from them. And uh, I think many of us who 
know about the dance masters, know that they never stood up and demonstrated mm. anything. Mm. So, uh, Padmini, you have also studied from uh, master, but they never stood up, mm. but they managed to convey very subtle aspects of light and shade and footwork, very subtle concepts just with their hands. You know, if they say, so then you knew Gedittana would be more graceful. Where the stress came. So, so many things which they did not analyze, but they managed to uh, convey. The other thing that I think for me made a lot of impact, which had a lot of impact on me, was the fact that. Um, You know, these masters, they used to talk about the past, anecdotes. They would be telling us about their stories about their masters, his grandfather and others. And the picture that emerged was one of great austerity, of grueling hard work and discipline, of hours spent on, you know, consecrated to the art. And what touched me and moved me and transformed me was their complete integrity to that work. I know things are very different, times are different, so we're talking about another era, as I said. But listening to them telling these stories, and some of them were not had nothing to do with dance stories that they said. I remember Keru Babu, Guru Kekshar and Mahapatra, once talking about the story about a pom he was telling us how a Pomeranian <laughs> attacked this tall man striding along in a dhoti, which was flapping in the wind. He was walking down. And that image has stayed in my mind. And I don't ask me what it has to do with my dance. Mm. It's not literal, there's not a literal connection. But they affect you at a subconscious level, which then transforms your awareness, deepens and intensifies. And so they had this great capacity to transmit the art. And uh, I really feel that I absorbed so many aspects of aesthetics, how one movement flows together. Kitaba Pillai, another great master who was related to my guru, would come home. And they would be, you know, working out how a particular structure worked in a particular way with the thalam. And just listening to them made such a difference. I understood how, you know, the alphabets come together to create poetry. So I think uh, these are some of the things often that I can think of. What about when you teach your students? When, uh -huh. <laughs> when I teach my students, I tend to be... I don't know if it is because we have so many more distractions these <laughs> days. And uh, it's very difficult to expect what? that. Huh? Mm -hmm. Pardon? What? Let me have a moment. No, the, uh, my students, it's different when I teach because I analyze a lot more. Because I think observation, concentration, focus and introspection, the kind of qualities that we were able to bring in that very quiet time is not possible today. So I sit and analyze, as I said, I say right angle, scope, lift. But one thing I do tell them, Spoon feeding will not work because this is like a jungle, making a path in a jungle. Mm. Uh, the teacher can teach you the principles of making a road. They can teach you about laying the bricks. They can tell you the dangers of, and the beauties of the forest. Mm. But ultimately, you have to take that road because if you just forge ahead, you will get to your destination faster. I was talking in the context of Abhinaya, teaching them Abhinaya and every little aspect analyzed like theatre, we do a kind of theatre workshop. Then I said, you know, if I go on like this, you will get there faster, you do Abhinaya well. But the result is you will know the role bit more than the jungle. You're not going to get to see the trees and the flowers and mm -hmm. as you clear that road. So I think that the way these masters taught was the, he gave me a... Uh, the principles, 
But then he allowed me to find my own way and to be my own dancer. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Absolutely. And thank you for, uh, you know, we were keen to start with, uh, you know, going back in time because also it's called Arts Fast Forward. Um, so, Anthony, one of the words that Wally used was immersive. We are happy for you to share with us, you know, uh, life in the conservatoire, like, you know, this whole idea of immersive, it must be truly immersive. Mm. So would you like to talk about that? Yes. C can I just start by t telling our audience a little bit about Trinity Larbert and what Please, it is? of course. Because I think it gives a context to, to my views. So it's great to be here, by the way. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. So I'm principal of Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance and we're based in London, England in Greenwich on the prime meridian where the eastern hemisphere meets the west so that's very symbolic for us and we're formed out of a merger between two institutions back in 2005 Trinity College of Music and Laban a contemporary dance organisation and Trinity College of Music, of course, has a very long history and a very proud history in... Am I not, am I not loud enough? Just you can, you can look at some... Can you hear me? Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll project. I'd rather project than okay. the mic, if that's sure. right, yeah? Right. Um, a very proud history here in, in India. And um, Trinity College of Music was actually the institution that invented the grade exam. And we have, of course, grade exams, not just from Trinity now, but other institutions in English, in music, but it was a Trinity invention back in 1870-something or other. So Trinity was known for innovation. It was the first conservatoire to have young students at the weekend, as well as people doing the professional training. The Laban organisation was the, although a small conservatoire in England, was the inventor of a degree in dance. It was a conservatoire, but it wasn't a university that first had degrees in dance. It was the first bachelor's degree, the first master's degree, the first PhDs in dance in the UK was Laban. So these were organisations that had very rich histories. But at the turn of the millennium, both of them relocated to new homes in Greenwich, London. So there was f f physical proximity between these two institutions, one of music, one of dance. But the other thing that they had in common was that their mission statements were about the future. They were about trying to work out what the world would be like for their graduating students. Because when a student graduates from a bachelor's degree at the age of 21, 22, these are training institutions. So these are institutions that develop people for professional careers in their art form. They will have 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the art form, in that time, the world will change majorly. How do you take advantage of your history, the knowledge that you've acquired from your masters, but look ahead and think, well, how do we need to change that to make it relevant for these people who will go into a fast-changing world? And one of the things that both institutions deemed was really important for the future was collaboration much more so than in the past. Artists coming together from different forms, not just working alongside each other, but actually collaborating to create new things. And so, in 2005, a music conservatoire and a dance conservatoire came together and, in truth, spent about five years before we could truly say that the whole was great and the sum of the parts. In 2010, I became its principal. And since then, I'm very proud to say that... Um, things are, are going very well. Economically not, and we might talk about that later, about the pressures of governments that are not for the arts or for higher education and what that means. But educationally and artistically, um, going very positively, because we're engaged in this difficult question about how do you develop the artists of the future. But they are young artists. You asked the question about the immersive training. So... They're people that come together. If I, if I focus on the, the undergraduates, because we have a whole... In industry, you call it vertical integration, because we have young people coming in from the age of three at the weekends. We have training courses for those identified with gift and talent um, from the age of 14, so that we can train them at the weekend, so that at the age of 18, they're trained enough to enter a conservatoire. We have bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhDs, postdoctoral research... 
etc., etc., and classes for old people or classes for people with acquired brain injuries. So we have this whole spectrum of work. But if I focus on the undergraduate training, which is at the core of what we do, uh, so we train people in music in all Western forms of music, so classical music, popular music, jazz, uh, and musical theatre, and we have contemporary dance. So it's focused on the Western forms, but we have students from 51 countries. One of the advantages of being in London is that we have people wanting to come to be part of this cultural mix, but the focus is on Western art. Um, but they come and they start at 8.30 in the morning and they work until six scheduled classes and then they go off and rehearse and do all that. It's very common in a conservatoire. It is immersive. They're totally involved in it. M many of them live on campus or very close to campus. Um, but, it's a, but it's a model that will be recognised by other people in higher education. It's very similar. I was at Cray University yesterday. Students work those hours and... You know, it, it, it's not an unusual model, but it is, they are immersed in their art form. Thank you for that. Um, Swarna, so moving on. Um, you know, you're an artist, researcher, curator. I know you're gearing up for your uh, festival in September. Um, and having learned dance in the oral tradition, I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, what is the lens uh, through which you have been curating programs and courses for the Global Arts Program at Korea? You know, what is uh, what is the lens that you sort of look through? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's a privilege for us to have uh, both Vali Akka, as I call her, and and uh, mm -hmm. Anthony here on behalf of the Global Arts at Korea. Um, so I think, you know, just like how Vali Akka addresses her gurus as master, I grew up addressing my guru as teacher, mm -hmm. also from the hereditary communities. Mm -hmm. And looking back, I think one of the things that um, defines me and a few other people from my generation of dancers is, I mean, listening to what she, she was saying is that practice as an immersion with the great masters or teachers, um, great masters, as she was defining it, was perhaps um, very similar, yet different when it was the female teacher. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, one didn't recognize that when we were learning with them because the, the process was very similar. The female teachers were also in many ways um, embodying the master's voice if, you know, they were like the masters in the classroom. But there was that the, the story, the, the, the movement of them being within the tradition uh, that was... I think apparent, but not to the learner at that point. And then the other thing that I was I was thinking about was how there is this great tradition, and then there are a generation of learners like Aliyaka mm -hmm. who then interpret and embody the tradition on themselves, taking it to the world, um, bringing that immersive practice in a very tangible way as performances, as conversations, as also their ruminations with poetry and other things, you know. So, so there was another level, another layer to uh, the traditional practice. And then us, who were learning with the traditional teachers, but then we had all of these, all of these dancers also and their conversations and their movements within the sphere. Mm -hmm. That made a huge impact. So I think dance, perhaps in the 20th century and in the early years of the 21st century, and I, when I say early, I'm, I'm referring to anywhere until the 50s, 60s, or perhaps even a little bit later, because we are in a different era, as she rightly said. You know, it's a completely different era now. So uh, the way we looked at the art um, brought a lot of ideas of what it means to have conversations about circulation, about movement, about uh, authorship, mm. about embodiment. Not conversations that one would have in a classroom because the classroom has always remained immersive. Very different from what, uh, uh, you know, it, not very different, but, you know, slightly different from the way we are trying to build an academic classroom, mm. right? So it is an immersive experience, uh, you know, even for learners of the next generations. Within, here, within India. 
but what really changed was the ability to have all of this scaffolding and therefore to think, the, the, the space to think, the space to converse, to dialogue. Not everybody sees the opportunity, but those of us who did, I think that's where the academia really sort of emerged. So I look at the early dance scholarship uh, largely focused on the social aspects or the, the social history of dance uh, or dance and music arts particularly but but eventually moving back into the immersive practice because that's where you really get your uh, food for thought mm. right so when we uh, tried to uh, design the global arts program at Korea all of us being practitioners mm. and immersive learners in different traditions I think that's what really changed the game for us. Uh, we didn't come, although we came from traditional scholarship backgrounds or we had academic degrees, at the heart of every one of us is this immersive practice that we've all been with teachers and masters and we see the value of what they bring even without talking about it ever. So what is this thing that we are trying to build around it not necessarily only sort of hegemonically sort of building it about them, but to both construct and deconstruct at the same time, uh, but to, to always keep immersion at the center of the heart of all of this. So I think global arts, I, I mean, if, I, if you ask me, uh, the immersion component is so important. I was just telling Valiaka before that, you know, at Korea, we don't have any illusions about how a four-year program or a three-year program can make a master dancer or a master singer out of anyone. You, it's not a conservatory, right? We don't have full-time practice like that. And they're very, very conscious of what we can't build. <laughs> but we're also very conscious of what needs, what art needs. It needs an ecosystem that needs to be built. Um, and that ecosystem can't be built by rank outsiders. It needs to be built by people who are already immersive learners who are practitioners themselves. So you have to peg yourself within any practice and then identify areas in which you can uh, find ways to work. Work with the great masters, work with the great traditions. Um, mutually beneficial, right? So the programs really speak to, uh, for example, I'm teaching a course called Pathways in the Arts currently, right? The idea is to help everyone identify their own practice. I'm not helping them form themselves better in their practice. That's not the, uh, uh, the motive of that particular mm -hmm. course. But to help them find other allies, uh, collaborations mm -hmm. as you call it, right? So what are the pathways in which you can think outside of practice within the arts? Um, I mean, you are doing a lot yourself as you were a dancer, but you know, you've, you've developed, uh, you know, uh, an ecosystem around what you, what you want to do with the arts. But how do we create more people like that? How do we create a constituency for the arts as a creative industry? Um, how do we build an ecology that can then uh, support us as uh, cultural economies? So I think those are really our larger questions. And because we're all practitioners and because we come with this rich understanding of practice from the teachers and with a generation of artists like Valyaka who've created and of course, the, you know, academies, mm. international bodies, right, who who have programs that are so robust um, and are great uh, models for us to draw from, but then to sort of remain within what we, what we have here as our strength and to sort of leverage this ability to immerse in our uh, different uh, ethos, communities, for example, community cultures, performances. So really the, the program... At the heart of it is really working with traditions, if I can put it that way, right? But constantly looking at what are the futures we can, we have to imagine for traditions. Okay. That's what we're going to discuss next. But before that, Sindra, I know that you are an artist yourself, mm -hmm. but not perform. Um, but really, could you just, uh, you know, so many of uh, mm -hmm. folks here don't really know about the Global Arts Program. If you could sort of talk to us a little bit about, since its inception, how has the program really helped foster a culture of, curiosity of um, critical thinking, questioning, and of course, learning. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, Swarna has already set up this conversation very nicely, right? right. Everything else that went before. So, uh, just to tell you uh, that the undergraduate program at CREA is, 
I think this is our fifth year in existence. And uh, the global arts uh, at Korea is right now in terms of degrees, it offers a minor. But uh, being a liberal arts college, the constituency of our classes, we bring in a lot of students from all <coughs> disciplines. So the, the, the global, global arts program being where it is, our constituency is really these people we are readying for the future, right? And as Swarna said, the four of us, uh, five of us who actually started with the global arts program, we all come with traditional practices. Now, I uh, learned Dhupal. Um, by the time we prepare to figure out how to breathe in order to play, say sa, right? Yeah. The typical uh, time, time of an Insta field is over. <laughs> so, I mean, that is, yeah. that is the kind of immersive practice. And many of us, we know that uh, some of the practices, though we have, you know, 30 second uh, performances also, the kind of practices that we, you know, work with, uh, they come from different stars, time scales. They also sort of gather different capacities in us or sculpt different capacity in us. In us. I want to give you an example from a class. In my first year creative expression class, I was teaching this classic short essay by TSN. It's called Tradition and Individual Talent. Everybody in this room, I think, is some, this is something that speaks to us, right? So, I've, you know, gone through the essay, we've talked about it, we're talking about how tradition is this consciousness of the past, and in Eliot's case, he's talking about all of Western tradition, the individual artist is bearing all this on them. And then the student puts up their hand and says, yeah, yes, but, um, uh, ma'am, uh, so let's say that we take time and time is, you're talking about vertical time, you're talking about tradition as this thing that flows through time. Now let's say that because I'm using social media, I can actually spread what I'm doing horizontally and I can do that really quickly. Is that a model through which tradition can work? I think that's a fascinating question. And uh, you know, I had to sort of, you know, put me on the spot and I had to really think about it. And what I had to think about is, what is this world of technology opening up for us? And it's a different world today than what we were inhabiting 15 years ago. The modes of learning, the way people are consuming, where you go to learn, everything is changing. Right? But... This other world that we've all come from, it has some things of value in it. Yeah. And which Swarna has referred to, which Valiaka has beautifully described, which Anthony has talked about and he'll talk more about that. So at Kriya, perhaps because, you know, we are uh, four of us uh, and uh, we put our brains together and we said, you know, we're not going to be that, that conservatory that produces experts. We would love to be old tradition, but we can't be that other. So what can we be? And we have a mandate, right? Uh, we are preparing uh, students for uh, the challenges of the 21st century. We are serious about our Kriya mandate. We also have eight guiding principles. Uh, and I'll refer to some of them. So how is it that we can craft an arts program that can speak to this? We came up with two rubrics. You know, you can call them metaphors, if you will. One metaphor is practice-led research. Mm. See, I teach in the social studies program also. So, I teach the methods course there. So, quantitative, qualitative, when you want to talk about anything complex in the social studies class, there's a certain way of doing it. I teach, uh, uh, you know, the arts, a course called Exploring Art, Understanding Culture. And I know I'm a different person than you know, the kinds of methods artists bring. So we said, so for me, practice led research, and I'll come back to it later. It means certain things. I think the arts program has a great deal to offer the institution because it teaches you certain ways of connecting with the world. And we'll get to it later. Mm. The second metaphor, as practitioners, you know, in, in Independent of whether you, you, know, you would be speaking 
uh, you know, fluent in a forum like this, mm. there are certain uh, conversations that we are having that we all sort of take for granted. We can understand each other. Or I work in Betia. This is in rural Bihar. I work with hereditary musicians there. There is critical art practice going on. This art practice is something that is it's a system of knowledge. And where AI comes in also, it's very interesting because much of what we're doing with technology is about data. What are we going to do with epistemology? So these are the things, the two metaphors that we started with, but it needs connections everywhere. So I'd like to stop. Thank you, Sumitra, for okay. uh, really, really like, uh, yeah. Um, I'm just going to focus on the future in the next round. Um, so, Anthony, I thought I'd begin with you. Yeah. And, um, you know, recurring motif, I, recurring word in the Laban uh, website is the word future. Yeah. So, um, really curious about, um, you know, this, why this word is really crucial in the world of the arts. Also, in the world of, I think, uh, Wally also made a reference to it, in this world of overabundance, um, how does Laban really provide an environment for a student to look around, but also consciously look within? That's a really good question. And of course, the future is unknown, but what we do know is that things are changing fast. And, you know, the arts, the arts has many roles, but, but, but one of the critical things about the arts is it enables you to reflect, to reflect on your existence, the world that you live in, and to make statements about it, which will hopefully help others to understand the human condition and the environment. And at the moment, this world is changing very, very fast, isn't it? I mean, we've had globalization, and now we're seeing a swing away from globalization back to nationalism and domestic priorities. You know, there are many countries that exhibit that at the moment. My own country withdrawing from the European Union is one example, but there are many around the world. Um, technological change, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute in more detail, but, you know, the, the world is speeding up so fast. Um, there are so many changes happening. It's difficult for people to make sense of the world, and we're trying to enable students not only to make sense of it, but then to go on to help others understand it by their art. Um, so, in terms of how do we help them within the institution, as well as our crystal ball looking to align our teaching practices, modern practice, and this, the, the, the guru thing is interesting as an example, because when I entered the arts, we respected the master much more than our students do today. The focus pedagogically has shifted from teaching to learning. So rather than the focus being on us imparting knowledge, it's on the student learning and getting we're, we're facilitating learning rather than telling them how it is. And the students wouldn't put up with anything else. So that they have changed radically when an 18 year old comes into Trinity Laban today. They are so different from the students of 20 or 30 years ago. One of the issues we have in dance at the moment is that traditionally in contemporary dance, the teacher will help correct, physically correct, align students, go on, touch, move. At the moment, there's a whole backlash against that going on now. Oh, so, yes. many changes. One thing that we do, just to, to highlight it in our curriculum, um, and this is unusual for a conservatoire because traditionally, certainly in European conservatoires, the teachers who are teaching, they are professionals. I mean, in music, for example, we have the one-to-one -one where for an hour and a half or two hours every week, a student and a teacher will be in a practice room together. The teacher will be a, a master. So typically, if you're a violin student, it will be the principal violin from the London Symphony Orchestra mm -hmm. that comes in to do the one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. And we have that. And the teachers are insisting that their students get this regular training, immersive training. But for two weeks in the year, in February, we insist that all teaching stops. They're not allowed, us teachers are not allowed to teach their students. But what we encourage the teachers to do, and we make all our students, over 800 of them do, is collaborative projects. 
projects where they come together, some are led, some are devised by the students themselves, some are devised by the teachers, some are devised by external artists that we bring in. But eight, over 800 people uh, get involved in collaborative projects uh, where the focus is not on product, it's on process. It's an opportunity for them to fail, to question, to explore together students from different art forms, musicians and dancers coming together, visual artists coming in from other universities. We bring in quite a lot of students from overseas the university just for this project, where they are immersed in risk-taking, experiment, failure often. And that's one way that we, we do it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Bali, you referred to the idea of time and of leisure. I want to ask you where, uh, you know, the world was obviously not running at the frenetic pace that it is today. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your views really provided you a canvas to dream, to explore all the words Anthony used as well, um, and finally really find your own voice? You know, some of the things that you said, I was listening to that about collaborative work. And, uh, you know, you, you might think that coming from the sort of background that I come from, guru, one-to-one -one mm. relationship, that there is no collaboration. Mm. May I just begin with that? Mm. That actually, many of these concepts, ideas, qualities are intrinsic to the dance. They are implicit in the training that we receive, working with musicians. Mm -hmm. When we, as we grow older, we get more understand. And music, for me, music, dance and poetry are absolutely inseparable. So the idea is that when you choreograph, you have to evoke that seamless link. But how do you do this without working with the musician? I was talking to Swedamanya about the huge frustration we have today, frustrations, of not finding musicians who will work with us long enough. I used to have people sitting for months, uh, the singer, when I worked in Sangha Poetry, I would come back please, to what you yeah, said, I just wanted to say, that she would go away up to the room for three days, she wouldn't emerge. I would have given her a poem and said, even in my first experience of composing with a musician, working on the music, and I would set it into scenes, visualize it in my mind, it would emerge in a particular way with structure. Then I'd ask her to create a fabric of music or visualize, evoke that in music. Then she would come down, we would work together again, I'd tell her, you give me this here, or you know, takita, takita. You, you know, the peacock you give to me in a particular way, give me a bee swara, give me a frass. Crabs were I in one case. Ooh. And she would do that and then so we would work together. When I worked with Arunati Subramanian, poet, eminent poet writing in English, I had to understand the tones. So there is a lot of collaboration which happens with master sitting there when he's working on those pieces that he's composing. And this is where I come to what you say, which is how did he foster that uh, environment where I was not a fossil, it was not, tradition was not something set in concrete. That it was a process which we shape in the present, it might be rooted in the past mm -hmm. and it looks to the future. Mm -hmm. So we inherit our traditions, but these inherited stylized ancient, this, these idioms, mm. I think, have to become languages of self-expression. Mm. Very personal, very intimate. So how did he do that? I think I was very fortunate because, you know, coming from the Pandanalur, it's such an ancient uh, language or family of dance, it could have become a straight jump. Mm. If he had said, <coughs> move your eyes only from there to here, or the hand can only go this way. Whereas what he made me realize that this is but a form, a foundation. But you are free to construct in time and space on that foundation. He was very clear because he used to, when I was 15, he gave me a song and then he said, Atilana. And he said, okay, me And in the, me 
So then I tried something and I still remember, and I think I've spoken about it. Uh, he said, why have you chosen those moments? So then I said, it looked pretty, it looked striking. Then he explained one principle of aesthetics, I call it, which for me has been uh, a principle which particularly in these days when there is so much of pressure to impress, to be sensationalistic and uh, catch people's eyeballs as they say. Mm-hmm. See, when in this time, I think what he taught me was Saraka Minikan. I call it the Saraka Minikan principle, substance and glitter. He said, you know, these alphabets have more of substance. These are the ornamentation, so content over packaging. Mm-hmm. He introduced that very gently. And he never, you know, I used to take up these little Tirmanams, these constructions of uh, sulfur syllables, rhythmic sulfur syllables. And he would say, okay, I said, sir, I want something. I would like to build on this, can I? He was such a, you know, these masters would have said, nothing doing. You yeah. do what mm-hmm. I teach you. No. So, Seri, let's see what you do with it. Yeah. So, then I took the structure, the core, and I built it around it. And when I did my Sangam poetry, which was after he stopped teaching me, he came and watched those and he appreciated what had gone into it. So, you know, that kind of... Uh, <coughs> he gave me a foundation, but he allowed me to be my own dancer. <coughs> styles, we have these styles, you know, the families that we belong to, mm-hmm. Barneys. They are but families. As in a family, you have individuals. Mm-hmm. You might share genes, mm-hmm. but you are individuals. So also, in that style, he allowed me to evolve my unique style within the style. So I was true to my roots. I believe I am true to my roots. But I feel that I have ample space to explore. That the it is expanding that frontier constantly. And there is seeking, searching, questioning, adapting and changing as I discover new forms of expression within the classical language. Because it is a language. Mm-hmm. And if you your idea is to write poetry with your dance language. Then to be a poet, you also create some forms within. But, you know, at the same time, I'd like to say I'm not a modern dancer. Mm. So I have a recognizable uh, structure. Framework. But that framework is a very, very elastic framework. Mm. And that is what these uh, great groups uh, yeah. Transmitted, imparted. Not that they discussed it like this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Bali. Um, Sumitra, uh, you know the beauty of uh, the Global Arts Program in the context of uh, the liberal arts environment is also the diversity. Um, could we just talk to us about how has uh, teaching um, in an ever evolving world at the, at the sort of the intersection of multiple disciplines been like for you, and what have been some of the key takeaways for you, both as an artist and as an academic? Thank you. Just as Valiaka was speaking, he's calling me Bundy. Okay, I'm calling Bundy. 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 Yeah, I just took my keys from my car. I'm not going to change. change. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a musician, not that, so I could take that liberty. So it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, as I was listening to Bundy, there's something that... Uh, Again, I want to come back to the setting that we uh, currently inhabit, which is the Global Arts Program at a liberal arts college in the 21st century. And uh, what I'm seeing around me of young people, you know, to have someone say and expect to be heard and understood that I believe I'm true to my roots. This is actually something that is quite difficult to articulate in the liberal arts classroom. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you will all agree with me. Um, I myself uh, have had, uh, you know, so we have to take ourselves to class. At the same time, 
I've had to understand that people come from so many different places. So this comes to the point about diversity, you know. You know, it is really important in today's world to acknowledge that we can have people who are very comfortable with their roots. I mean, for whom, you know, I'd like to believe what Swarna said, that we take tradition seriously, but even tradition can be a difficult word. Yeah. Yes. And a fraught word. So, there is that. And uh, then we have uh, people, students, young people, many of you may be, you know, interacting with young people every day. And even people, maybe, if not of my generation, of the generation next to me, uh, but people for whom questioning, without questioning, without actually saying that categories are there to be broken, who say that, the minute you say tradition, you see box. Yes. Right? Whereas for us, tradition is an enabler. Right. It's what sculpts our ethics. Right? right? Our ways of being in the world. So, how, for me, what, Kriya enabled or offers and slowly we will bring these con conversations in is the ability to bring these differences into a classroom. And I truly believe that the arts affords a very different connection, um, a space in which uh, you, can, you can actually engage with very difficult, complex questions. You can read Foucault, okay? Or you can read Judith Butler, whatever you know, theorist you want to read. They'll get at the same issues. But when you use the arts, you, you immediately acknowledge the spaces of emotion, the spaces of empathy, the spaces of difference. So, the question of ethics, and it's a different uh, space. But I do believe that with the 21st century classroom, uh, the conversation has to be had. You can't, mm. you, I mean, I, I believe, you know, very closely in the kind of world that uh, Maldi is describing. And um, I'm comfortable there. But I also acknowledge the discomforts that people yeah. feel. I mean, I'm really hopeful they will acknowledge also the discomforts I might feel <laughs> in another, another space. So I think that is the really important conversation to have if we don't want to lose the plot here. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Sumitra. Um, Swarna, so the pedagogy of Kriya is, you know, we talk about uh, the spirit of interwoven learning. Um, can you tell us about how it unfolds in the classroom? Even in the comms team, we're so curious about how it unfolds in the classroom. Yes. We're always writing about it, but it would be great for you to just kind of distill it for us. And um, how is it, this idea of interwovenness, how is it really uh, impacted and shaped your own understanding of uh, your practice and research in the arts? Yeah. Um, an inside joke at Kriya from day one has been the IW, the word, <laughs> the interwoven, right? I mean, um, I think the, the advantage that uh, Sumitra and I and many others here have had is we walked into Kriya when it was, it was getting created, yeah. right? So um, one of the reasons why, I mean, I'm an independent dancer. Uh, my practice is at the heart of my life. Um, so to hitch myself with an institution where I have to uh, only teach, right? And I say only teach, not in the, uh, in a desperating way, but just to, just to take my practice out that, that many hours, even though I'm a scholar and I'm an academic and a researcher, was not something I was willing to do until I met Kriya. The reason being that um, one of the things that resonated with me was the fact that they were able to, or they were willing to, acknowledge the porosity of disciplinary thinking, um, the porosity that should exist within disciplines, between disciplines, between uh, different languages that are spoken. You know, we may all be speaking different languages. I mean, the language of science or the language of technology or the language of the arts. But we're all speaking to the same thing at the end of the day, right? I mean, we're all speaking about the common issues of the community, the common issues of the world. And we're all looking for 
we are all living in the same 21st century. We're all heading towards the same future, mm. right? So what affects a scientist is affecting an artist is affecting differently, but also similarly, mm. right? So uh, for me as a researcher, when one of the things, as I said, you know, because learning with the traditional gurus who didn't speak, but it, it was the osmosis, but also the women, I think when, you know, you're able to, one was able to sense a, a sense of community, right? Seven women in my dance class, um, all fighting with each other, right? Because seven women and, you know, there's household chores and all of that to be done. But when you step out into the classroom, uh, you're able to, you're able to get that sense of, you know, this community and life, this, this busy, active, very sort of contentious life. But also it's distilled into the classroom in a very different way. So, you know, the family, the woman, the problems, the society, her struggles, um, her relationship with the outer world, all this somehow made a part of what, the, what was in my head. So when it was time for me to think of academia, I couldn't but think of anything else but looking at this more deeply. So the social engagement really became the center of uh, my own scholarship. But not just the social, the social and the historical. Historical, not because it's just tradition. Uh, although all of the things that we say about tradition is so true, but I totally agree with what Sumitra said that, you know, it's a moving, changing, dynamic thing. And it's only perhaps in these generations, in the last 20, 30 years, that we are able to have a more free conversation about the fluidity of tradition. The ability of tradition to shift and change and suit and become adaptable. And that it's okay. It's not sacrilegious. Right? Um, so for me, collaboration is very important and I see collaboration at every level. But I think there's one more word that is so important. The collective. Yeah. Right? So in my class, I teach students the difference between what is collaborative work or collaborative art production and collective art production. In a collective, the onus, the responsibility, uh, the ideation, uh, the failures are equally shared. <laughs> it is a community endeavor. Even if it's a solo artist performing, the community takes equal credit and the, you know, and the responsibility of the failure. And in, the in a collective, you also have a lot more of trust you have to build it over a long time uh, you can't just snap your finger and say you know I think let's both let's both work together so it, it's a it's a longer sort of engagement uh, so when you bring the community sense into this the future then belongs to everyone so everyone's politics everyone's questions everyone's discomfort become important for us to engage with mm -hmm. So in a futuristic classroom, a Kriya, I would say a Kriya classroom for the arts is definitely, a, the reason is we have young people who are, who are interested remotely in the arts sometimes, <coughs> who are somewhat practitioners who've given up their active practice for maybe four years to be at Kriya. So look to us to bring a certain, you know, immersion yeah. within the campus. So there are all kinds of people there. And there are also skeptics <laughs> saying, what, tradition? No, no, we want to look to the future, right? So the, the conversation needs to include all of them, to bring, to acknowledge the diversity at all times. I literally mean at every turn, you know. So, for example, you know, I was I was showing them a Tayyam video in classroom. We were discussing something about the Tayyam. And uh, it, it was a lovely conversation that was unfolding. And I'd asked them to do a discussion board. So, using technology. So, they were all... Dis and suddenly, in the middle of that, I had one student saying, Professor, I wish you had warned me. You'd given me a trigger warning. There is fire in the... in the." You know, it was a, it was all of one minute. That fire with the... With, and it's part of the tradition. You know, that their mask is lit up, huh. right? What looked beautiful and what looked intriguing and what looked like tradition to many others was triggering another student in the class for some other completely different reason. Hmm. We have to stop, yeah, acknowledge, yeah. understand, dialogue, conciliate and move on. We, we cannot anymore look at tradition as sort of, yeah. you know, this holy, set in stone, yeah. Uh, so that's a huge and for us it's 
it's a challenge every day because <laughs> i come from a place although you know i think uh, i always say i lucked out with all the female gurus and you know with the with my guru virali male muttakanna mala ma who still with us because you know with with them the conversations are so simple about you know how is how is it to be a woman in this world and you know so we are discussing but you know if i come into the real world of dance it's still very much in many ways set in stone right a lot of the traditions are held together by gatekeeper gatekeeping and gatekeepers mm-hmm. but the classroom is not that any my so therefore for me kriya is like a breath of fresh air i also know that we're unleashing upon the traditional world of arts a new set of youngsters <laughs> who are here to deconstruct um, sort of inhabit this space very freely um, you know and they are not afraid of uh, bringing the collective in and questioning why it's not the collective that owns anything right so i think we're giving them that ability uh, but we're also very conscious that we're giving it to them from the space traditional spaces from which we come so we're constantly trying to build this dialogue between diversity and tradition it, they don't always sort of you know i mean because it is a contentious relationship right but it can but they find their own ways of answering these questions and we just have to as anthony rightly put it you know we're not any more we call ourselves as it is facilitators you know i we stop, we don't call ourselves teachers what do you teach hmm. right you facilitate but once you even in that facilitation you stop at a point and then you let them lead you and so the classroom is really many things no one i don't think any two classrooms or any two classes even of the same course and within the global arts uh, uh, are the same so that's as diverse as it can get Thank you for that, Swarna. So I just want to say that collaboration. You know, Instagram also has a feature now called collaboration. Yeah, so yeah. collaboration is really, really happening mm-hmm. across. But I just thought we could talk quickly. We could do one round on technology, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And if each of you could just uh, share your thoughts and its impact in the world of the arts, and then maybe I could open the floor for some questions as well. Yes, please. Yeah, because we're here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're already at twelve thirty. So one quick round of. Uh, I think we can like start. Yeah, um, I'm very happy to. Well, uh, <coughs> yeah. well, of course, artificial intelligence. I mean, they've been building it for quite a time, but I mean, it suddenly hit, hasn't it, with Chat GPT and all of that in the last year. And we are all, certainly, universities in the UK, reeling a little bit and thinking, how do we respond to this new world? And most of the focus, actually, in the traditional university, has been on the large language model. the chat gpt and how that changes the world and of course it's going to be a major major disruption in the sense that many of the traditional jobs the jobs that you go to university to be able to do lawyers accountants a lot of medical jobs radiographers are already virtually redundant by the the technology um this major disruption but in our world in the arts the other model um the generative adversarial model the 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 ai that is creating creating images creating music creating <laughs> art but it's not people that are doing it it's the model that's doing it and how how do our students that engage with that world are not replaced by that world and that's what we're grappling with at the moment so i so i don't i don't have all the answers what i do know is that these models can and should and i hope will facilitate young artists with their art rather than replace them as artists and i'm a fundamental believer in that we want to engage with human beings we want uh, we, <coughs> we engage with a painting or we engage with a dance or we engage with a piece of music it's important to us that that has been created by human and so for us at trinity laban we we're, we're trying to catch up but we are looking at how we can allow our students to use these models to help create rather than be threatened by them as as people that will take over yeah. so that's going to be the future yeah that is the future yeah, absolutely yeah. uh sumitra would you like to yeah to always about this listening to anthony and you know he he put uh, it is put us right there if ai is able to create art good art uh, and uh, you know people enjoy 
or interacting with it. So, what then is the meaning of arts practice? So, it's a big question. So, I think we have to go back to thinking, thinking about what is it that the practice of art enables. So, I go back to saying that critical arts practice, really thinking about, first of all, what is art, right? The object itself. And then I want to go back to this distinction you know, between data and knowledge. So, when you are an artist, it's not just the sound, which is the end product, which the computer or the AI will give you. It is everything else. It's that, uh, you know, that metaphor of somebody walking in the Pomeranian a barking, but you don't know what it has to do with your art, but it has stayed with you. It's recognition of, of art as an experience that engages. Right? So that's one thing. I think that one needs to think about. Um, and possibly the other thing, and here is where I feel technology has to be a collaborator, but there's a lot to be learned from the older traditions, from the conservatories, you know, because un unless you, you actually acknowledge and understand what it is that the practice of art brings you you won't you will not be able to figure out where technology belongs in this conversation so I, I i personally believe that technology is not going to be a replacer but we need to figure out why it can be part of the conversation and uh, there are a lot of cognitive theories that actually can help us mm -hmm. and so Different conversation, but I think the classroom is also a great place to have these conversations. So, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think um, to imagine a future without technology has become almost has become impossible. Yeah. And in a classroom setting, we are, you know, we are with young people who don't know a pre-internet era, right? And increasingly, as the classrooms, so. So to talk to them a language of the pre-internet era um, needs to be done very carefully. Um, also, for us to be able to imagine the pre-internet era traditions and you know arts within this world also has to be done carefully. Right. So it is a partnership between them, a generation, and us who are with them. You know, we brought. Um, uh, you know, two wonderful um, technologists who are also whose partners were actually uh, performers and theatre practitioners, and we got them, uh, you know, from Germany, and they interacted with my class, and they showed us Cyber Ballet, which is one of their productions, you know, online, and so it was a VR production, right? So um, we had the students wear the VR set, and they were walking around, and you know, the the ballet was entirely. On, on the virtual space and so everybody the self was so important at that point because each one was interacting with it with a headset in in the way that they could so once one went into that world you are able to see how the same art is many things for many people we are not anymore you know watching it from the same perspective so perspectives of ways of seeing has really shifted but as someone from another era, for me, was what was interesting was also looking at all of these uh -huh. people with headsets walking around. I saw the movement and I saw their circulation. For me, that was dance. Right? So, both of these become important. So, I think it is in that partnership that the future lies. It's not in handing over our futures to technology in entirety. Um, we can't do without, it. I mean, Instagram and all of this is necessary evil or necessary partnership of today, there is no denying it, uh, you will be left behind. So the, the idea of the self, I mean, we were, you know, we were, one of the things that we discussed in this earlier on was the idea of the self, idea of nature and community, right, cultures. Uh, the self, I feel, you know, if you leave it alone today without technology or anything else, is a very lonely being. Uh, you know, you don't want to be lonely like that. So you have to necessarily partner with your cultures, the plural, and you have to partner with uh, nature because you can't, technology at the end of the day is trying to draw from nature. You know, it wants to stimulate, augment 
everything in the world outside world into this virtual world so you know uh, i think you bring a tremendous value to it if you are a person of the world as well so i definitely place technology as a very important future partner but not without the people not without the real world experiences we have to keep feeding that in so i think that's where our roles become Absolutely. somewhat uh, important and Un- until we are the generation of the pre internet era and then our next generation of facilitators would also be all internet era so i don't know what's that for the future that's that's for us to wait and see right bali would you like to say something <laughs> what i want to say is that you know i've been hearing about kriya a lot and uh, i had been you know hearing wonderful things but after listening to all of you and trinity i have known since my school days with the big students who been studying there that so these conversations i was just thinking my earlier self when i was younger so i said that the traditional uh, conditioning the uh, foundation that i had <coughs> allowed for expansion because i find it fascinating all that you've been saying what she was saying about you know also multi disciplinary uh, interaction between various uh, fields but one thing i just would like to say about technology and i'm going to i come from a situation where as i said it was pre all this and you would say paradoxically but i think i am creative because i did not have to deal with negotiate with these issues that the younger generation absolutely have to a different kind of creativity the other thing is that from a solo bharatanatyam classical dancers perspective it has been a boon and a bane youtube for instance we have the advent of a youtube guru it uh, sets up uh, you know one thing that technology gives us huge amounts of information but without discernment mm-hmm. how do we decide what is true and what is false and what is uh, real and what is not that is a problem i see with my own students mm-hmm. the other is the culture of imitation that can some because we're constantly being exposed to visual images on the one hand it can be hugely enriching mm-hmm. but there again to discriminate and to absorb and maybe that's why we need to have these classes to talk to mm-hmm. then you know to come to some understanding but what i do see is that there's a lot of confusion caused by this <laughs> and then you tend to imitate because constant visual images so books are some of the pitfalls that i see no oh, absolutely and discernment is such an important uh, quality i think it's one of the uh, you know kriyas uh, we develop yeah. that's why it's just so wonderful yes yeah. absolutely um i have a couple of more questions but it's 12:30 and if any of you would like to ask any of the panelists any questions please me if you do so you could just take um, three four questions and then to that Please, Ms. Woods. Yeah, I can start off. Sure. Um, yes, please. Why, uh, one of the things is it's lovely to hear the world on you speak about the future, since it's arts, past, and ever. I think one of the things which we have is present things here, and uh, we have some dance experts here. We've been talking about tradition, we've been talking about technology, and stuff like that. In the world of arts education, in particular in India, because we deal with elementary education uh, and not higher education, which you guys are dealing with, there's a lot of <coughs> standardization which is there. So the fundamentals are pretty scattered. Okay, so this everybody has their own approach to teaching. That's what probably our traditional music and traditional dance forms. Whereas in the West, it has been a little bit standardized. Not only in the three areas, but also with standardization. So maybe it's for any of you to kind of just uh, mm-hmm. assess that what is the impact of the standardization in the quality of teaching art? We say we we rooted. We believe that tradition gives a lot of rooting into the subject itself. So that was fundamentally going through my mind when we were having all these discussions. Thank you so much. Would you like to respond? Yeah. Good. Go, Vidya. 
Um, I mean, we were discussing so much about diversity. Um, I think it's very critical for us to um, acknowledge that tradition is not singular, but it is traditions. And you can come at it from different directions. Um, so, I mean, I, I do understand that we've, a lot of, lot of traditions have benefited from the standardization. I mean, for example, institutionalization of traditions has largely benefited from the standardization, right? Or institutions in turn have standardized a lot of things. But countercultures today, which is also one of our, you know, important discussions in, in our classrooms, particularly at Kriya, right? I mean, in the sort of post-colonial world where we're looking at, we're, we're even investigating traditions, the question is, what has this standardization done to us? The same question that you ask. Has it benefited us? Or has it taken away the community responsibility that we once held? And without much of that standardization, after I was talking about Barney's, for example, um, and the many individual strands that each dancer could take, none of this came from standardization in that sense. Right? It came from one's own ability to immerse and the levels at which one could immerse and embody. Uh, so I think in that sense, we may have a very uh, unique model here in India for the arts, in arts education particularly, to offer if we work with it. Because I think that's where the partnership between traditions and institutionalization really becomes critical. Because you don't want to rush towards standardizing anything. Um, uh, because that hasn't that won't serve the purpose of diversity and inclusion as well. So we have to keep the many strands and then and allow students to engage with them in the way that they want. Allow practitioners to engage with them in the way that they want. Uh, and many things could emerge out of that. Far more beneficial and perhaps fruitful and interesting for the world and for us out of the out of the way arts can be uh, seen, you know, as a co-creator. So I don't know if standardization is something that we are uh, we are interested in even perhaps. Even so in a solo traditional form, standardization is the worst thing that can happen. Exactly, because then it puts you into total rut, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you become a factory product mm -hmm. rather than an individual full of facets and dimensions and the ability to grow and change, True. which is what a good tradition or traditions do. True. And so you want to yes, yes, as well? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of discussion about standardization, mm -hmm. and uh, the one institution that mm -hmm. can come up is Kalakshet. Mm -hmm. And um, but when you look at the graduates of Kalakshet and how they have uh, set up a path for themselves separately, each one is very unique in their own style. So when students are finishing their graduation, there is a standardization. But once they come out and begin to uh, start a path for themselves of journey, then they go into their own uh, uh, way. So this second generation has showed us that when it was institutionalized, there was a lot of criticism. And uh, when you now look at Wali, for instance, uh, was taught by Subrai Bhandai. And chocolate was taught by Subaraya And chocolate Pranis. And chocolate. And they taught in Kalakshay grounds, the two of them. And each of them, of their students, is different. Wali is very different from her cousin, who also learned from the same girls. You know, how that, that how did that happen? And every one of the Kalakshay graduates mm -hmm. is different. They have uh, their own way of dancing. So when you're training, it is uh, when you're looking at tradition and you say that you this has come from so many generations in a family, uh, there is a way of teaching. And then when absolutely new people who have uh, no connection uh, family-wise coming to learning, there is a need for a certain kind of standardization and introduction. And then equip them to uh, start a path for themselves. Okay. <coughs> Journey. Thanks, Vinita. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Professor Simitra also wanted to respond. Um, yeah, just very quickly to go with standardization. I mean, a hundred years ago, writing, right? The fact that we used to put out music books, that was, you know, a lot has been written about it, 
So the question was, you know, did it destroy depression a hundred years hence? Um, mostly the way writing circulated, at least within music, is that you worked with your guru, you got your gayaki or your style, and then you engaged with the text, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it is true that when they were, you know, in, in schools all over, the standard pedagogy was enabled. So at one level, there was standard pedagogy, but tradition didn't completely self-destruct or anything. You know, you know, we imbibed, took the text and worked with it inside. Now, I want to point out the difference with today's moment. Today, with technology, the sound is available to you. You don't need anything coming between uh, between the, the, the sound that you hear. You've got pitch correction software which will tell you how to yeah. hold the ray in Marwa. Thank you. Which, you know, a very different thing than somebody telling you, you know, that note should come out like a person standing up in a crowd. But this is a metaphor my teacher uses. Mm -hmm. So, this is a different thing. It's a diff So, I think technology is actually a moment where you really need to think because uh, it's direct access. And I believe that archives really working with, you know, the conservatories, the oral traditions and bringing them into the same conversation as the technology with everybody will use is actually a very critical moment now. So that's the string your eye. Yes, and please, no, please. I have also, I think it's been a beautiful conversation, so maybe this your question. Uh, coming from a background that is also, you know, in a sense, standardization was a part of my learning. And as a teacher, which I feel where as teachers, we need to be a little uh, discerning is not to confuse the grammar for the poetry because we are creating a grammar and that's important. I think any language needs a grammar so that the poetry is effective. But when I confuse the grammar for the poetry and I teach it as poetry, I think that's where the problem would start. So if I understand that I would, that's what also, you know, they're working with. But I have another question for the panelists. I think there's one, uh, no, there's one. Sure, yeah, sure. Just sure. Just sure. A, sure. Small, a small observation. Yeah. If the letters of the alphabet, say in English, you have appendix six, can be deemed to be the template of standardization, what it produces in terms of combination and permutation mm -hmm. is limitless. Mm -hmm. Can you say the process of creativity, say in the arts, arts pass forward, fits into that template and that answers a lot of questions. No, it doesn't. It certainly, I think, uh, I mean, going back to the, the metaphor of the grammar and poetry, I think what we're trying to um, tell, you know, share here is that there are many grammars. So grammar, grammar too is not singular. Mm -hmm. And to acknowledge that is by itself an education. You know, a, an education of the future because you have, in order to engage with the form, I know we keep referring to dance as another language mm. and therefore I think it's very easy for us to have the idea of alphabets and therefore the idea of uh, letters and phonetics and sentence formation, etc. But, but it is far more expansive than that. It is, it is a collection of many cultures, of many people's lived experiences and you have to see that as many in order for us to acknowledge that and therefore then forge forward. Therefore, there could be many standardizations if one wants to really go at that direction. Tradition was standardizing. Yeah. I mean, like Padanuru style, there was a standardization of that style. And if you look at Kitaba Pillai or Mahavaili Shuranko Vimutaya, Muthuswami Pillai, there was their standardizations for different ones. No, I think but it's more institutional. What, no. what the student takes is something very different because the student has to be creative enough to take it forward, isn't it? I mean, I mean, we go to school and we learn English language and we learn Tamil, we learn uh, standardized way of and then we become poets and writers. Yes, and it. Sure. And then John, maybe. Go ahead. Slightly more rapid standardization. Okay. Um, we at CAB have worked at a nexus between Western, Indian, and technology for 12, 13 years and struggled with some of what you've been discussing in terms of those friction. Um, 
our Indian classical traditions are taught largely from an oral perspective, our Western traditions are taught largely, and we ourselves, because we have no experts in both, don't try to mix that with that students being as parts that combine the same words their way through. Most recently, we've been having discussions with them in terms of challenging colonialism, which we need to do, particularly with so many foreign faculty working within it. And we got the students to begin to come up with their own post-colonial manifesto on what they want to change. And what they came up with was actually colonial, mm. in many, many senses. And part of the larger discussions in terms of this global education shift, I hear a lot about bringing Western ideas, particularly within the arts, into India to help strengthen arts. But having worked on both sides significantly, what do you think are the main tenets from here that can actually help a failing arts academic system in the West? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of that dialogue has been very one directional and actually a lot of the topics that are happening in UK education and higher education in the arts. Some of what I find that happens here could benefit greatly over there. What do you think some of the main lessons that they need to learn from here? And I'm listening for the answer. <laughs> okay, I thought you'd go to respond. <laughs> Perhaps you could start with it. No, no, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is I, I, <laughs> okay, want, okay. I want to hear how, yeah, 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 how we could be helped because I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah. We, we have a lot of issues with Western education and arts education, and I'm sure we can learn, but we need help. What, what, how can you help us? Yeah. Mami? <laughs> it's a great question. I, I can't presume to you know, know all the problems, but I, mean, I do read some of the newspapers there, so I have some faint idea of what is uh, problematic, but I can only say what I cherish. We were talking about standardization and, and alphabets. You said different alphabets. It's, it's, that's true. There are many, many languages that we have to recognize. But I think when we say we have we have to have certain flavors, certain fragrances, certain, you know, colors. If you have kitchery of everything, if you, so that, but the problem is that I think what she was saying also is when we talk, it's, it's not restrictive. When you say one language, we have to look at everything. But if we look ourselves in a particular, let's say that my language is Bharatanatyam, I try to see, but I'm rooted in this. And from here, if I learn to grow, because that rooting gave me the courage of conviction to make changes, to adapt, to grow. So I don't know in the West, the system of training, of, if everything is being torn to bits, then sometimes there can be chaos. So when a student begins, is it perhaps good for them to have a certain foundation framework which they can find strength and security from and then let them find the freedom yeah. because it all depends on the teacher, it depends on the one who's receiving that information. My, I know my master gave differently to different students depending on what he felt each person was capable yeah. of yeah. receiving. So if we can assume I'm not giving that as an answer, but I sometimes get the feeling that there is okay too much of an obsession with being, let's say, PC9 by not throwing a huge... <laughs> uh, you know, too much of an obsession with being current, being too much of terminology and if we could just be and get into whether it's an art or a language or whatever it might be, if we could experience it fully have the guidance and <coughs> have a little more openness to that and not feel you have to confront everything immediately. I think because that has happened with the true. Um, you need to have some foundation before you can break it or choose to true, break true. it and go somewhere else. Right. True. And then you're free to do that. Absolutely. I accept that. But initially without knowing 
the alphabet of one language. That's what my mother used to say, that you need to study, uh, you know, be able to express yourself and articulate in one language, because dance is a language. And I use many of the uh, principles of essay writing that she taught me in my choreography. So if we can internalize one discipline and then start breaking, uh, that is something which I feel students in India that I teach, I feel benefits them. Well, I think it's not the juxtaposition. I mean, we're not here to, I mean, I don't think the idea is to juxtapose mm. um, the idea of any form of formal training and any immersive learning, as we call it, versus being exploratory. Mm. I think the idea is to allow them from the beginning this space to ask a lot more questions. Mm. And so in a in a format where you're, you're able to expand, for example, I mean, I'll go back to Adam's question because I want to bring his very important question in. Um, the idea that... Um, that there is a there is a problem in the way we are we are looking at scholarship, and the way that is feeding back into practice, not essentially only to the UK. I think it has had a huge impact in India as well. Uh, you know, some of us, some of us who, uh, you know, who who work within the 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 scholarly world of the arts, constantly you know confront how we've taken post-colonial engagement, you know, a bit too far in the sense, I mean, it, it should go further, but, you know, not in this sort of dogmatic direction. So even, even so much so that even decolonial studies has now been imported for us from the West in such a colonial frame, right? So, so, so decolonization too. So, 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 you know, I mean, we've, so that's where I think the, the, what becomes important are the many, are the many traditions that we have here. And it's useful to go back to oral traditions, useful to go back to archives, useful to go back to some of the ways in which one was able to take the osmosis. In osmosis, there's no standardization. It's a very individual journey. And uh, you are able to provide equally that space for everyone. The osmosis is there for everyone. So it's inclusive. Yet it's very diverse because you take what you can. Uh, I give you everything I have. So in many ways, I think the future of maybe global education, particularly arts education, is to show the expanse of what's possible. And uh, everybody carves a path for their own self. I mean, that's where I think the critical questioning of the academic uh, epistemological questions and uh, problems also come in, right? Otherwise, you are you know, you are inducted into a tradition of... Uh, academia. I mean, how many of us, you know, we are weighed down by the frames that are set, right? You have to write within those frames if you want to be published. You have to say the kind of things that need to be, that want to be heard. You know, any kind of counter counterculture is, is, is even different. So, there are traditions within academia too that are so hard, hard kept and, you know, gate kept. Right? So, you have to, I think, uh, you have to allow for all of that. So, therefore, you have to keep it very open is my view. I strongly believe that you have to unfold and that's what Kriya does. To me, that's the most exciting part of a Kriya, Kriya classroom, right? Uh, I'm able to design a course, walk in there. There is a standard, there are exams, there are certain, you know, sort of, but I'm also able to break it down at the at a Jiffy because I see that the class is so different and that they, they want to engage with this particular subject slightly differently. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm saying let's wing, let's wing with it. Let's see what we can do. But we have to keep immersion at the heart of it. That sort of thing. Thank you, Swana. We'll just take one last question here. Yes, so two quick ones. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Nabi uh, The first is to, first question is based upon the practice of that is that you need to know the rules of all to bring. To that end, is it easier to be conservative mm. compared to the liberal arts institution in most regard? Because for a common conservative, because they want to know. Right, and so they will go to the radio's work. Whereas on the other hand, people can try to get away with slip sharp work. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. curious about that. That's my first question. The second one was about traditions. You said you've got the very learning. But how exclusionary can you say? And this can be important in some senses. And I'm thinking about this with a point of view of caste and tribe here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And please, thank you. I've heard of a number of cases where it's difficult to be black doing money. Mm -hmm. You know, this happens pretty deep. No. And 
and we had thought conversations. But we needed to know the middle ways to heal. <laughs> and does it mean that some traditions serve as a cement for the whole, and yet those, by virtue of their construction, exclude? Thank you, Jim. Uh, let, me, <clears throat> let me try and at least answer the fir first part. It should be true that if you attend the conservatoire, you are prepared mm -hmm. to learn from step one, to learn the rules and then break the rules. But my experience, in the UK at least, is that when they enter a conservatoire, typically at the age of 18, they have had 18 years of formation. And in our culture at the moment, that makes a uh, a young student generally quite resistant mm -hmm. to starting in year zero and learning the rules before they break them. They already mature in so many ways, and the ways are are are, are not ways that enable them to to start from the beginning and learn the rules. So that's one of our challenges, because I agree, learning rules then learn to break them, but not as easy as I think it should be, even in the conservatoire. Mm -hmm. The second part about belonging, you're absolutely right. We, we teach ballet. <coughs> we don't, our product is not ballet dancers, but ballet is a very, very good training technique for contemporary dance. So all of our contemporary dancers take ballet. Ballet is an issue in two, two places at the moment. First of all, our black students are a, a small minority, even though the population in London at the moment, you know, is 40% black. Um, but black conservatoire students, you could well be the only one in your class. So you could be the only black student in a ballet class. And, and that is difficult. But the other difficulty we have with ballet is it's gendered. It's, the history is gendered. Male roles, female roles. Females dance on point, men lift females. And that is very difficult at the moment with all the trans issues that, that we have. And we're, so we're having to rebuild our ballet curriculum to, to, to non-gender it, effectively. Mm. So that these are very live issues at the moment. Do you want to respond to... Maybe try and connect... Yeah. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Uh, try and connect the two, perhaps. Um, but yes, I think I agree completely with Anthony that you know, the conservatory talk I think John's proposal that yep. the conservatory is probably a place where you can teach people how to build. At a liberal arts college, they come in with questions. And that too, the questions are, you generate questions by immersion, by learning an oral tradition, by being in a conservatory, you, you learn to generate questions while you're building your ethical framework. So the process of questioning that is really important Oral traditions have to allow for that uh, in order to stay relevant, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the lessons that one can take away is that this kind of immersive learning can allow for different grammars to emerge, mm -hmm. can allow for difference and for the process of question. Mm -hmm. So it's not that when you uh, learn the traditional way, there's nothing to be uh, sort of given to the contemporary world in terms of being able to ask questions, which is really important. So to try and, uh, you know, think across these pedagogical models, I think would be very productive. And uh, the second thing I think to what John was saying, see, this, the, the question of race or caste, in India, it's, a, this, it's very difficult because let's leave it on classical music, so much of our cultural practice is embedded in jati. So are you going to de in it? This is a challenge that we face very, very critically. Not to come in the way of movements, you know, including the Ambedkar movement, right? Where you need to come together, you know, as Dalits in order to claim an identity and to mobilize. At the same time, we all know that the subcategories of Dalits have their own ways of dealing with culture. And so, you know, this question of de assassination I think is, we've not talked about it, but I think it's confront confronting society in a big way 
and in order for uh, i think the arts practices and culture in general uh it sort of brings it to the fore and it gives us an opportunity in that sense to make our pedagogy in the arts speak to the conditions of the world yes if you are having religious con- conflict if you are having ethnic conflict if you are having caste conflict if gender is the most fluid thing and it is in the classroom how is it that the pedagogy in the arts i think has promise for that Absolutely. and i think that's where uh, our future mm-hmm. also lies in some sense looking within because i think a lot of this the arts actually creates the the space to connect differently and this is i i'm citing again i want to close at least my the speech with or whatever my my whatever i'm saying to you with again something of a student uh this is a student who is in my social studies classroom she was also in my arts classroom at the same time we were talking about the same things i'm the same person teaching very differently in both the classrooms and she said you know i really like the arts class mm-hmm. because in my social studies classroom we keep reading texts and we move on there's no time but in the arts class you don't move on mm-hmm. you in you stay and you have you can't actually walk away from things so i think this question of pedagogy is really whether it's the question of ai and the threat to us or you know us but uh, is is it really reflecting on what kind of critical arts practice you know, what is this arts practice what does it bring what kinds of connections can it enable and what does it need in order to stay alive so that's in the you know um there's this kateko to telco to practice and this girl called tiragavati has uh, broken uh, um, stereotypes about it. girls not you know she can do arjuna pro but when it comes to ritualistic practice okay well it is a kurta is also ritual yeah? and uh, a guy who is performing as arjuna the whole night is not allowed to climb the uh, the tree because it is ritual so they say your your caste you know we can't allow you to do that mm-hmm. you can perform and tilaka cannot do that ritual because she is a woman and she, uh, she is a dalit so it is the village that has allowed a girl to perform karna or arjuna all night they are willing to sit and watch her perform mm-hmm. all night but when it comes to ritual they say we have the scopes mm-hmm. you can't break it you know so it's it's also what the society allows as you are performing and as you are breaking the stereotypes you can't just go and say uh, you you know uh, you can't you you are being exclusive yeah you know if this is uh, you can't go into the village and scream at them it is they who have to let this happen mm-hmm. isn't it but what about talking about what he was saying about the classical arts for instance yeah. do tend to be exclusionist they do it's a fact that caste is very much a part of the entire thing yeah. and it's strange because the original isai vernala community are now my master was made to feel so uh he lost you know his self esteem was broken with you know the whole uh, you know the background so the end result is that he never taught his children and i know that happened in many many families when i died out in their families these traditional masters and it is a fact today i have asked you know sometimes there are teachers who will not teach people from a different uh, caste so I mean, that yeah. happens yes it is a particular it's, it's a fact yeah. in dance maybe not so so then how do we uh, change this it's it really is a very thing in mother's names i think some very you know on this because what is the core of our art today would be very important is the individual's growth the I mean, any individual's growth at the core of all that we have been uh, talking about in as teachers what we are teaching or is the art itself with all its rituals uh, its boxed in traditions more important because i think today if as teachers and which is what i think personal teachers work with they work with the growth of that individual why tell the story of a pomeranian on a road 
it was the growth of an individual that mattered. But if somehow today the art, the structure, the scholarship has become more important, with that I'm afraid the ritualism and everything will be given that importance. Josna, but it's also an economic fact that, mm -hmm. that dance has become so expensive that how do you know there is a lot of that we have to do. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's what the times uh, demand. As uh, they, the arts change their <laughs> role in society and what they mean for people. Um, I just want to say that uh, I wish we could stay, but Sadhya is calling. And, uh, and thank you so much. This has been a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, I just really think my takeaways from this are that conversations like these are really, really important. Collaboration is really the only way forward. Future is very, very unpredictable and the arts is a constant work in progress. Um, so if any of you would like to visit our campus, if you go to the website, then you'll see a, um, a tab there called Campus Tour. So please sign up and we'd be happy to show you around the campus. If you'd like to interact with the folks at the Global Arts Program, please reach out to the communications team with connecting with them. But uh, now, I'd now like to invite our Vice Chancellor, Mr. Nirmala Rao, to say a few words. I thought I'm going to even ask a question. No, go ahead. In the context of Dr. Nicola, I just want to request for thank uh, for putting together such a distinguished panel and for moderating uh, such a fine stimulating discussion. Thank you. And I cannot thank you all enough for giving up your time to come and share your reflections. And um, I just want to say what it's done is, of course, it's enriched my learning about I come from a very low base here, medical scientist. But what it has done is enable me to understand the dilemmas and predictions of our colleagues here. Both in terms of um, uh, so well you expose the problems, and uh, both in terms of gathering tradition in the context of the modern interwoven, uh, you know, arts, liberal arts, the context in which they operate. I can understand and empathize, sympathize. Mm -hmm. The difficulties you have of um, bringing the two old traditions, the multiple traditions together. But more importantly, in strengthening my conviction, and um, there is a space for the global arts to actually be nurtured and be put in best and create a niche for Korea, if I may, take the opportunity. And you can hold me to that. But equally, it's now been one year since I've uh, worked. In um, Korea and in India, and uh, I have to say, I've been seeing such a, a fine, burgeoning interest for the arts, uh, particularly because Temple and Chennai, even when I was growing up, I won't say how many years ago, <laughs> more than five decades ago, uh, it's always been the cultural capital of the country and yeah, intellectual force. Um, when I see the developments here, and it's only getting stronger and stronger, I also straddled the boundary with the higher education in the sector in the UK. And a question for Anthony and Vida is, um, if I put art fast forward, what is the future for creative industries in the UK, given the changing landscape of student demand, which is probably, I don't know if I may, if I'm right in saying it's declining, to some extent, but in the context of also the tightening of the, finance, the government funding for the arts, yeah. completely it's under sense. <clears throat> yeah, well, the first part of my answer is quite depressing because I think we're going to go lower before we come up because we've had many years of a government that doesn't care about higher education and doesn't care about the arts, and as a consequence of that, young people are in school are not getting exposure to the arts. The, num the number of young people who take... The two main exams in schools in the UK are the GCSE at 16 and the A-levels at 18. The number of students taking those in art subjects in the last 10 years <clears throat> has halved. Halved. It's a massive decline in young people engaged in the arts. So I think for the, for the next 5, 10 years, I think it's, it's not good. However, in contrast to that, I think in the long term, and I'm thinking 10, 20 years, the artist has a bigger role in society, and that's not just in the UK. I think that's in world society. 
than ever in this changing world that we're seeing. Questions about who we are and how we exist and coexist and interact with nature. You know, we, one of the things we didn't talk about today because of the time was, you know, the environment, the sustainability of the world and what's happening to it. I think the artist will have a greater role. And because a lot of the a lot of the jobs that are done by humans at the moment will be done by AI, it actually gives an opportunity for the artist to have a bigger role in society. So in the long term, I'm optimistic. In the short term, certainly in the UK, I'm not. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for sharing so generously. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Uh, that you're going to